members of Congress and distinguished guests, my fellow Americans, we gather here today to right a grave wrong. More than 40 years ago, shortly after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, 120,000 persons of Japanese ancestry living in the United States were forcibly removed from their homes and placed in makeshift internment camps. This action was taken without trial, without jury. It was based solely on race. For throughout the war, Japanese Americans in the tens of thousands remained utterly loyal to the United States. August 10, 1988, 46 years after being imprisoned in concentration camps, Americans of Japanese ancestry finally received an official apology from the United States government. <laughs> Sure, it's long overdue. It should have happened much sooner, yet I think it's a victory. This is what we fought for for 46 years. The ceremonies today um, made me feel that for the first time in the past 46 years that I was an American like the rest of the people. With the apology, Congress also awarded surviving internees redress, symbolic restitution to individuals and the community for the injustices suffered. The effort to convince Congress of the importance of this monetary compensation faced formidable obstacles. It severely tested both the Japanese-American community's resolve and resources for more than two decades. This is the story of the unprecedented grassroots campaign for redress and the major role played by the Japanese-American Citizens League. At the end of World War II, the ban on Japanese-Americans living on the West Coast was lifted. Many returned to face the challenges of restoring their lives and their communities. The JACL worked to change the citizenship laws which had discriminated against the Issei, and it sought compensation from the government for property losses suffered as a result of the evacuation. However, under the Evacuation Claims Act of 1948, the first attempt at redress, the strict requirements for documentation excluded many claims. Other internees were forced to accept settlements far below the value of their losses. And there was no compensation for income lost or for physical and emotional suffering. Many Japanese Americans were embittered by the inadequate settlement terms. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. In the 1960s, with attention focused on civil rights and America's racial injustices, Japanese Americans began to discuss more openly their own painful experiences during World War II. JACL members sought to repeal the laws which still permitted the internment of civilians without due process. Their successes encouraged them to explore further political action. At the 1970 National JACL Convention, Edison Uno, a San Francisco community activist, first proposed seeking monetary restitution for Japanese Americans interned during World War II. He was the one who not only conceptualized and intellectualized uh, the redress effort, but he went out and he demanded that the Japanese American community recognize uh, what had been done to us. He wanted to deal with this thing on a very different level than anyone else was, I think at that time, ready to deal with it. Um, and in order to deal with it as a political issue, you had to have a political organization. The JCL as a civil rights organization uh, in the past had that kind of a network that could be activated. The UNO resolution proposed that $400 million in reparation funds be used to revitalize community centers, ethnic study centers, and museums for all minority groups. In Seattle, a group of Nisei pursued a different approach. Their 1974 redress plan was the first to focus on individual monetary compensation. We decided uh within the GCL chapter and others that we should make a audio tape and a transcript which was to summarize the form and direction 
and the philosophy of why we are addressing redress for Japanese Americans. No amount of demonstrations of loyalty by the Nisei can ever disprove the false accusations in the minds of most white Americans. That can only be done when the government of the United States publicly declares that the wartime uprooting and imprisonment of Japanese Americans was totally without justification and awards the victims of its wartime outrage proper and reasonable redress. We distributed about 200 copies of this uh, appeal for action to the 100 JCL chapters, uh, the Nikkei congressmen, our own Congress uh, people in the state of Washington, and various Nikkei communities all over the United States. Edison Uno and the Seattle Evacuation Redress Committee began to gain support for redress across the country. Groups such as EO 9066 in Southern California conducted public forums to educate the public. This whole experience was a traumatic sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It was a wound that is festering and has festered for all of these years, and it will not heal unless there has been some resolution to it. And to me, reparations represents that sort of resolution. In 1976, Dr. Clifford Uweta became chair of the JACL's National Committee for Redress. He enlisted the ideas of experienced community activists such as Ray Okamura of Berkeley and Peggy Nagai of Portland. They developed what was the first real workings of a redress campaign. They put together a booklet called uh, Japanese American Internment Case for Redress. That became the first official published work of uh, the redress campaign. Uh, and then April of 1978, Clifford brought together representatives from all of the JSL districts. Uh, we met at the San Francisco headquarters of the organization and for two days hammered out um, the guidelines for redress. That was the beginning of what became known as the $25,000 compensation figure. The Committee for Redress and local JACL chapters increased their efforts to raise public awareness about the internment camps. During Thanksgiving weekend, 1978, the first Day of Remembrance was organized in Seattle. The Puyallup Fairgrounds was selected as a site for the Day of Remembrance uh, because uh, it served as assembly center for Japanese Americans before we were put into the more permanent camps in Idaho. My former uh, housing area is located right in the middle of this grandstand area and uh, we felt it was an appropriate area for people to come back to and relate to their previous experiences during the wartime period. The caravan was miles long. There were well over two or three thousand people there. It was surprising how many Japanese Americans were there, not so much that they were there, but that they were willing to go through this, uh, to relive something we knew they didn't want to relive. For the first time that uh, Japanese Americans faced up to the issue and were able to relate to the evacuation process and to the redress movement. The next year we had Days of Remembrance established on February 19th to commemorate EO 9066, and those were held in, in uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco, as well as up in Seattle. As support for redress gradually increased, the JACL Redress Committee recognized the need to work with the Japanese American members of Congress to develop legislative action on the redress issue. In February of 1979, the committee met with Senators Daniel Inoue and Spark Matsunaga and representatives Norm Mineta and Bob Matsui. I recall a pitch being made for the immediate consideration by Congress. And when I was called upon, I said, uh, I think it's premature. I don't think it'll fly. And I suggested first uh, an educational program, not only to educate uh, the non-Japanese of the United States, but the Nikkei members also of the United States. Because uh, I got the impression that uh, not everyone was in step or in tune on this issue. Uh, needless to say, the JSCL officials were uh, very much disturbed and disappointed. 
and they were hoping that all of us would come in, uh, flags waving and saying, let's make the charge up the hill. And um, I think for a moment they were ready to take away my membership card. The Committee for Redress voted 4-2 to two in favor of a two-step plan that would call for a federal study commission on the internment. The commission's findings would then be drafted into a future redress bill. That decision provoked angry reaction. I started getting threats from Japanese Americans. There was that much anger about that decision. They said that we were, we were backsliding and that we'd really sold everyone out. Better to go directly after monetary compensation on an honest fight and lose it. The dissenting members of the Committee for Redress continued to pursue direct redress legislation. Mike Lorry uh, was a candidate for the congressional seat in our district in the state of Washington in 1978. And in the subsequent year, 1979, Mike Lorry introduced the first bill in Congress for redress for Japanese Americans. The Lowry bill, however, died in committee. The Japanese American legislators were fully committed to establishing the study commission. The sponsorship of House Majority Leader Jim Wright, whose district in Texas had few Asians, was critical in passing the commission bill. After he came back uh, from the war, he had heard about uh, what happened to Americans of Japanese ancestry and when he was going to law school. And he thought it was absolutely outrageous as a young law student. And he said that we're going to have to rectify this terrible, tragic mistake. He said yes, he would be more than happy to be the lead uh, sponsor on this. And so we thanked him very, you know, shook hands with him and walked out of, the, out of his office and walked about 50 feet to the corridor, turned right, got into the elevator, and we got into the elevator and the door closed and we're going, yelling away! Because we were so happy, we, but we didn't want to do it right out in public and we were yelling in the elevator. On July 31, 1980, President Jimmy Carter signed the law establishing the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. This is where we had another disagreement uh, with the JSCL. Uh, some of the officials uh, strongly suggested that the majority of the Commission should be made up of Americans of Japanese ancestry. And on the other hand, I insisted that uh, let's have just one because uh, this commission will have to sell the Congress on the idea. Fortunately, uh, the President of the United States selected an outstanding American of Japanese ancestry, a judge in Pennsylvania, Bill Maritani. And uh, he did his job uh, quietly but effectively. He was the major resource person for the commission. The National JACL, its chapters across the country, the Washington Coalition on Redress, and the National Coalition for Redress and Reparations helped with arrangements for the hearings and encouraged former internees to testify. On July 10, 1981, the first public hearing was held in Washington, D.C. In the next two years, more than 750 witnesses would eventually testify in 10 major cities. I would like to draw your attention to six incidents in which eight individuals of Japanese ancestry were shot and killed by the armed sentries who were supposedly there to protect us. Because of, of time, that was a lot of to us, we did not we were not able to sell our hotel. All our personal properties and my car were given to our guests that lived at our hotel. I also loved America. I get goosebumps when I sing the Star Spangled Banner. I believed what our teachers taught us about what a great country America is. Suppressed for 40 years, the emotional testimony gripped the attention of the American public and solidified the Japanese American community's commitment to redress. Two other major redress efforts paralleled and added to the momentum of the legislative campaign. The National Council for Japanese American Redress filed a class action suit for monetary damages on behalf of the internees. 
And in a rare quorum nobis legal action based on new evidence uncovered by Peter Irons and Aiko Yoshinaga Herzig, the cases of Min Yasui, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Fred Korematsu were reopened in three separate federal court districts. The three men had tested the constitutionality of the evacuation in 1942. In February of 1983, the Commission issued its findings in a report titled, Personal Justice Denied. Its conclusions, Executive Order 9066 was not justified by military necessity, as claimed by the U.S. government in 1942. The broad historical causes were race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. The Commission's recommendations included a formal apology from the United States to those interned establishment of a trust fund for civil liberties education, and individual compensation of $20,000 to each living internee. Despite the Commission's recommendations and the sponsorship of several members of Congress for a redress bill, there remained significant opposition to the idea of funding redress. By accepting the debt which the $1.2 billion uh, is going to incur, the committee is asking us to purge ourselves of somebody else's guilt with another generation's money. The redress legislation was stalled in committee and prospects for passage seemed remote. Persistent JACL members in their home states gradually began to win converts among their local representatives, but broader support in states without Japanese American communities was needed. Recognizing the need to shift the focus of the redress campaign from education to coordinated political action, the JACL established the Legislative Education Committee, or LEC, a political lobbying arm specifically for redress. Min Yasui, one of the earliest and most effective redress advocates, was appointed chair. He recruited Grant Ujifusa, co-editor of the influential Almanac of American Politics, to be the volunteer legislative strategist. I don't think the redress movement would have happened uh, without Min Yasui. Why? Because when it was initially proposed by some members of our, our community, I think the rank and file Nikkei thought this is preposterous. It's 40 years too late. But when Min said this is what we have to do, Min's, Min's stature uh, in itself um, made the community stop and think about it. That was 42 years and 10 months ago. Today, of course, we're here blessed with the presence of official dignitaries saying that was wrong. Yes, indeed, it was wrong. Starting without funds or a staff, the LEC would grow to become an integral part of the redress movement. The combined efforts of the JACL and LEC would eventually raise one and a half million dollars in support of the nationwide lobbying activities for the redress bill. Grace Uehara, newly hired LEC executive director, began to commute regularly to Washington, D.C. to coordinate the grassroots campaign. All of the chapters um, had been working on getting various national organizations, city councils, mayors, unions, uh, professional organizations, uh, to pass resolutions in support of redress. So that, ha that was the foundation. She would report to us and say, I think uh, Senator so-and-so may be uh, wavering a little. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go after him. And if we wanted uh, a little pressure being put on a certain congressman or a certain senator, uh, the JSL would call up uh, the chapter in that state and say, can you call upon your senator and do something about this? The LEC mobilized the network of over 100 JACL chapters across the country, gaining valuable access to members of Congress from states without many Japanese Americans. In a Philadelphia JACL meeting, Grace Uehara learned of a potential lobbyist in Atlanta, Georgia. She wrote to me and said how crucial it was that they get two more votes. They would probably be from the Republicans and one candidate, possible candidate, was Congressman Swindle. She um, told me how crucial it was to get this out of subcommittee and could I help. That was really a challenge for me. I immediately started to formulate plans on how we could persuade him to vote for the issue. The work of hundreds
hundreds of community redress activists like Jean Doy was coordinated and kept informed through action alerts, which contained up-to-the-minute legislative updates and lobbying directives. Speaking at churches, schools, civic groups, and on television and radio talk shows, sending countless letters and telegrams, these grassroots activists informed mainstream America about the importance of redress as a constitutional issue. And they personally persuaded numerous members of Congress to sign on to the redress bill. persistence in lobbying her congressman was rewarded when after two sessions of inaction on the redress bill, the chair of the Judiciary Subcommittee was filled by Barney Frank, an ardent redress supporter from Massachusetts. And so between uh, Congressman Frank and with uh, Jean Doy continuing to work on uh, Congressman Swindle, uh, the, uh, we had one hearing and uh, then the bill was reported out of subcommittee. It was just tremendous. It was just great. This bill is not about Japanese Americans. This bill is about the Constitution of the United States of America. The heroic World War II record of the Nisei veterans with the 100th Battalion 442 Regimental Combat Team and the Military Intelligence Service was critically important to the lobbying effort. Forty years later, I was able to point to my colleagues that, look, these people were loyal. They died in Europe on behalf of the security of the United States to make sure your parents and your mother and father were secure. And that went a long way in convincing my colleagues that these were American citizens. JACL LEC strategists also enlisted the resources and assistance of other established lobbying networks. A task force for redress was created by the JACL and representatives from America's most highly respected civil and human rights organizations. By a unanimous vote, the Leadership Conference designated the Civil uh, Liberties Act as one of our top three or four priorities for the 99th Congress and for the 100th Congress. From that moment on, we worked very closely with the Japanese American Citizen League, the ACLU, the American Jewish Committee, the NAACP, uh, the Anti-Defamation League, and many, many other organizations in the Leadership Conference. For me, it was one of those splendid opportunities to demonstrate how coalitions work. While the grassroots lobbying of members of Congress, letter writing and coalition forging gradually built a very strong base of support, the LEC turned its attention to key votes in Congress. Grant's responsibility was to talk uh, with the Republican conservatives. Uh, he was uh, instrumental in getting Jack Kemp uh, to sign on to the legislation. Uh, Dick Cheney, uh, who was another conservative from Wyoming, uh, he also uh, went on the Senate side and was very, very influential in getting Ellen Simpson uh, to play a major role in the legislation. And he had access because people knew Grand Ujifusa through the Almanac of American Politics. These efforts coordinated with the remarkable personal commitment to redress of the late Senator Spark Matsunaga resulted in Senate action on the bill. He I think looked upon this measure as his life's commitment. He was almost obsessed. It is unheard in the annals of the United States Senate for any bill to have 74 co-sponsors. And the only way that one can do this is to get personally involved. And I know that he went from office to office at times spending not hours but days weeks with just one member going back to him again. And uh, well, when it passed, it should have come as any surprise because they had committed themselves literally in blood. In 1987, H.R. 442 was finally debated on the floor of the House of Representatives. I went to the speaker, who at that point was Jim Wright, and I said, Mr. Speaker, um, I'd like to see this being, being discussed on the floor of the House of Representatives on September 17, 1987. 
That's the 200th anniversary of the signing of the Constitution. Today we will resolve if we can finally lift the unjust burden of shame which 120,000 Americans have carried for 45 painful years. I will never forget that moment when my colleagues were watching the vote count and when we reached that magic number of 218, which is a majority, members were coming up to Congressman Mineta and myself and embracing us with tears in their eyes saying, we did it, we did it. Six months later, on April 20th, 1988, the Senate took action on the redress bill. Uh, it was a happy moment for Spock. It was a moving moment. I, I remember when he gave the closing remarks in the debate, uh, he, for good reasons, he got choked. And, uh, but uh, this was his day. It belonged to him. Members of his family still still bear the scars of that incident. And I myself become overly emotional when I think about it even to this day. The celebration throughout the Japanese-American community was short-lived. Indications from the White House were that President Reagan might veto H.R. 442. Various attempts were made by legislators and redress activists to persuade President Reagan to sign the bill. When the LEC learned of President Reagan's scheduled visit to New Jersey, Grant Ujifusa contacted Governor Thomas Kane, with whom he had once worked as an editor. In a limousine speeding across New Jersey, the governor spent 45 minutes lobbying President Reagan for redress. He responded favorably and asked, uh, asked his chief of staff, Ken Dubestein, to, uh, to give him much more information than he had had up to that point on the bill. And Ken Dubestein said to me they hadn't really had a chance to talk about it deeply, other than, other than the fact that it had these people who were giving, I thought, the wrong advice. Grant uh, was able to come up with some information. And that information was uh, that the president had already, when he was an actor in California, um, a very good relationship with the Japanese-American community. In a follow-up letter, the president was reminded of a special ceremony in 1945 honoring slain 442 soldier Kazuo Masuda, who had been denied burial in his Orange County, California hometown. Ronald Reagan had spoken at that ceremony in 1945. For Ronald Reagan, to make it personal was to make it real. And so Kaz Masuda made it personal and made it real for Ronald Reagan. On August 10, 1988, in a ceremony coinciding with the JACL National Convention in Seattle, President Reagan did indeed sign H.R. 442. In his remarks, the president quoted from his 1945 speech about Kazuo Masuda. Blood that is soaked into the sands of a beach is all of one color. America stands unique in the world, the only country not founded on race, but on a way, on an ideal. Thank you and God bless you, and now let me sign H.R. 442, so fittingly named in honor of the 442nd. Only a few months later, Japanese Americans were confronted with yet another major obstacle. Senator Inouye, a member of the powerful Senate Appropriations Committee, interceded to ensure that the Civil Rights Bill of 1988 would be properly funded under an entitlement provision. Uh, to the surprise of my colleagues and others, I said, let's go for the, the full bag, make it an entitlement. I had collected over the years uh, a lot of chits that I was willing to cash in. So as we would say, <laughs> in our shops. For most Japanese Americans, more important than the monetary compensation was the public vindication, finally, of a profound injustice and the restoration of their faith in the Constitution. 
we had to get remove this feeling of injustice and humiliation and bitterness out of our system. And I think the more we spoke about it, it helped do that. Well, I think the uh, significance of redress and why uh, all of us were, whether it's JCL, LEC, NCRR, members of Congress, were successful in getting this bill passed. It's the fact that uh, it was not considered to be just a Japanese American issue that it is indeed an American issue because this is involving some very, very basic constitutional rights. And, uh, frankly, it was through the organization of the JACL that we were able to develop this very powerful uh, force uh, in American history to actually move this bill. Tuesday, October 9th, 1990, the Great Hall of the Department of Justice, Washington, D.C. Attorney General Dick Thornburg presented the first letters of apology and checks for $20,000 to the oldest surviving internees, Issei, now more than 100 years old. tremendous odds have given us both the leadership skills and the confidence to confront the many serious challenges which our community will face in the years to come. Strengthened with the knowledge and experiences gained during the redress campaign, we must be ready to accept the enormous responsibility, the challenge, and the opportunity to continue and enlarge our long-standing commitment to uphold human and civil rights for all Americans.
more information on other programs on Japanese American history and the internment during World War II, please contact the National Headquarters of the JACL located at 1765 Sutter Street, San Francisco, California, 94115.